Good evening, folks, and thank you for coming out. My chief role as ever is to introduce the president of the Academy, Glenn Withers, but that'll have to wait for a moment because I see that I'm needing to remind one and all and invite you to any of the public lectures that the Academy gives, and we give a number of them during the year. One, the Cunningham Lecture that is associated with our annual symposium. The Peter Carmel Forum, which is a, always a terrific event. The Faye Gale Lecture, held in Adelaide and one other city generally. The Paul Burke Award for Early Career Research, and there are four of those, and they're held at the home campuses of the winners of the Early Career Awards. And then there's the Keith Hancock Lecture, and then finally, something we've had to create called the Occasional Lecture, or Forum, and that's what we're going to do tonight. So to introduce you to the forum, I will introduce you now to the president, Professor Glenn Withers, president of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Glenn. Uh, thanks so much, uh, John. It, it sounds like uh, our arrangements are forming some sort of uh, blockchain of the social sciences, the way we're linking these things and our people together, which might be no mean thing if we get onto the the latest trend and terminology, there's more money in it. So uh, we'll see what happens. But thank you, John, for the introduction uh, and yourself and uh, the, the staff from the Academy, the estimable staff from the Academy of Social Sciences for organising this evening in support of uh, what is both a talk and a launch and many other things uh, at once, a discussion. Uh, but let me please start with the welcome to uh, country for uh, this, this land we're on, this area in Canberra. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I want to acknowledge and respect their contribution, their continuing culture, uh, and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome uh, other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's uh, event. Uh, we're pleased on uh, behalf of the Academy of Social Sciences to be in a role to facilitate this special public forum. Uh, and uh, tonight we've entitled it with the name of the book it will reflect, which is uh, Fair Share, Competing Claims and Australia's Economic uh, Future. Uh, and this is uh, an important thing for the Academy to have found a vehicle for, which we just invented, as John indicated, an occasional forum or lecture, because what we want to do is not just recognise our social science talent, which has been a long-standing function of this and other academies, but also of course, to promote the development and application of those uh, social sciences, which we think are crucial. Uh, these days, the Academy of Social Sciences is partnering also the other academies um, in uh, engineering and in humanities and science to try and also do projects that are multidisciplinary to bring the, re the reflections and the contributions that each of those academies uh, make to understanding some of the challenges that uh, we face as uh, a nation, a people, and uh, see if we can't uh, bring some of the, the top minds uh, in those academies together. But we've got top minds we're bringing together tonight in our own uh, sphere of the, the social sciences. Uh, so what better way to, uh, to implement a, a new approach to special forums than through a book on Australia's future, uh, and one that combines the uh, the deep academic thinking and frameworks of Stephen Bell, a fellow of this academy, uh, with the high-level bureaucratic and poly policy experience of uh, Michael Keating, a fellow of this academy, and a commentary uh, on those themes arising from John Hewson, a fellow of this academy, uh, and with John's own blend of academic business and practical coalface experience coming together on this. So we're, we're doing our own multidisciplinary uh, integration of what we should be thinking and what we're finding uh, about uh, the, the themes of the volume that, that Stephen and Michael have uh, brought together. There's a, a thesis and an antithesis and a synthesis in there somewhere, but I'm, I'm not going to ascribe it to particular contributors this evening. We are looking forward to learning more and sorting out for ourselves how this uh, comes together in, in what ways. We're going to start with, um, uh, with John, John Hewson, uh, and then we'll have Stephen and Mike uh, following, 
Uh, and uh, I guess now that I'm no longer Universities Australia, though I am the Academy of Social Sciences in my responsibilities, I do note that John's a professor of ANU, uh, Stephen's been a visiting professor at ANU, and Mike's a visiting fellow at ANU. Uh, so if only Professor Schmidt was here, I might get a salary increment for engagement and impact. Uh, <laughs> But uh, going from zero to a positive number may or may not mean much uh, in what that would produce for me. We've got John for 35 minutes or so as the, the main uh, address this evening, then 10 each for Stephen and Mike, and uh, then a Q&A for 15 minutes for folk uh, here who want to engage uh, with our contributors. Um, then it's... Uh, drinks in the main foyer for 30 minutes. Uh, for someone like myself, the implicit weightings in those arrangements are very interesting. Uh, but John out, outweighs the drinks. You get 35 minutes and the drinks are just 30. <laughs> By the, the canons of economics, that means you're, you're highly valued, John, and uh, I won't venture into what it means for Mike and uh, Stephen at 10 minutes each. <laughs> but they're definitely high valued and uh, that means you've got to go and buy the book, which is very important to uh, access the, the absolute depth and uh, originality and uh, and what I think is really good in the book, because I did see an earlier version of a, a draft of the manuscript, uh, the way it integrates so many areas and brings together what we're, we're really looking for, which is indeed a, a vision or a synthesis as well as, of course, the, the micro underpinnings of all of that, and you get all that in, in the volume. So we're really looking forward to getting our copy. Uh, I'll start with John, uh, as indicated. Uh, John, of course, is uh, well known, as I said, for his... For, well, that, that's the main claim to fame. The current ANU role, of course, is uh, what we all know John for. Uh, but he has also done a few other things. Uh, he, he had uh, early origins in areas like the IMF and the Treasury and the Reserve Bank, plus also being a policy advisor in, in Parliament uh, for the, the good and the great at that time. He's also been a, a UNSW professor. Uh, we used to refer to him in economics at the time as the travelling professor of economics. That such was John's habits, which have not changed. He's uh, found everywhere, including, for those of you who are interested, uh, on tonight's themes, I sat and watched the uh, Centre for Independent Studies um, uh, telecast of a discussion about John's contributions through uh, fight back and what, what something like fight back means today as well as what it meant in its uh, earlier incarnations. And uh, it was a fascinating discussion. You can pick it up on the Centre for Independent Studies um, a site at, at any time if you can uh, master the modern technology. And for those interested in these sorts of trials and tribulations, I'm doing a debate tomorrow night with um, Mark Latham and Judith Sloan on immigration, which will be uh, a challenging exercise. <laughs> uh, so John will be first, and then Stephen, uh, Stephen will follow, and just briefly add to what we, we already know about Stephen. He's been at the University of Queensland for, for quite a while now, I think back in the late 90s. Is that right, Stephen? So I recall. Uh, as Professor of Political um, Economy. And before that, variously graced uh, Griffith and UNE, University of Tasmania, uh, and for a, a break at least, the Copenhagen Business School at, at one stage. And Michael Keating, to a Canberra audience, uh, is, is very well known, uh, and most of those of us here tonight will know Mike's been the, the head of uh, three Commonwealth uh, government departments, uh, I think the order was employment and industrial relations, finance and prime minister and cabinet. Is that the sequence? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Mike's, of course, uh, done a range of other things since that time, including at state level as well as at uh, federal level. And his PhD from ANU uh, meant that also that he's kept a continuing association through council membership and visiting fellowship and all sorts of other things. So the combination we've got tonight is uh, fantastic. And uh, we'll uh, ask, therefore, uh, if, if John would now wish to start off, please, John. Welcome, John. Well, thanks very much, Glenn. It's a distinct pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to speak at the launch of this uh, significant book by two people who I respect as uh, both thinkers and practitioners in the field of government and policy and... and uh, I, uh, I see this as a distinct privilege, but I should begin by adding my recognition to the Indigenous people the, uh, on whose land we meet and pay my respects to the uh, 
elders of the Ngunnawal people, past, present and future. And I might I say as a personal sidebar, um, I'm looking forward to the day that we do actually give proper recognition in our constitution to our Indigenous forebears and, um, and uh, do something, really make genuine progress in the area of uh, Aboriginal disadvantage. And I think um, there are two very large policy challenges that have been sitting out there uh, getting kicked down the road more or less most of the time. Um, I must say that uh, as background to what I was going to say tonight, I was delighted to, to see that uh, sound bites and stunts didn't count for much as a claim to government in South Australia last weekend and the fact that the Xenophon team didn't do very well at all. And um, you know, there's a hope that maybe we are moving into a world of better quality government, better public policy, but maybe that's a, a vain hope. Um, uh, Mike and Steve uh, start their remarks by saying that we're living in a very troubled world, politically and economically. I must say I've been analysing and forecasting economies since the late 60s when I worked in the Treasury, through all, all the various careers that I've had since then. And I would say this is the hardest time that I can remember through that period to say how the world economy might unfold uh, in uh, economic, social, political terms. Environmental terms, I mean, the uncertainties are enormous. I think the risks are greater than I can remember them. The unpredictability is, is, is greater than I can remember. And um, at a time where we don't seem to have much of a focus on the delivery of good government. There's a hell of a lot of politics being played around the world, a lot of short-term politics, but not too much focus on government. Um, you know, there are a number of features of the current scene that really worry me. We have extremely high debt globally. Now, I thought we had high debt when we went into the GFC. In fact, the GFC was basically a debt crisis built on the subprime uh, loan in the United States, and that mountain of debt collapsed in 2008. Um, but I just looked at some recent IMF data to see that global debt today is 65% higher than it was in 2007, 2008. You know, and that is staggering. Um, and... Um, we have unsustainable carbon emissions globally, although we've got the Paris Agreement, we're not making much progress really there. Um, we've got um, disruptive technologies and, and things like the social media, which uh, have sort of got generations of people imagining that all solutions should be instantaneous in their effect. And that's making life particularly difficult, I think. Wages are flatlining, job security is mounting. We've got low interest rates, excess liquidity, uh, rising inequality, what worries me, a concentration of economic and market power in most countries. Um, against this, we've got a lack of policy capacity. Uh, I looked at the G7 balance sheets, the balance sheets, I should say, of the G7 central banks, and they are three times as big as they were at the time of the GFC. Central banks have pumped an enormous amount of liquidity into the global economy without any of the effects that they might have expected in terms of boost to investment, to consumption spending, certainly created a fair bit of debt, additional debt. It certainly created a, a fair bit of additional inequality. And, um, and we're now in a position where they have very little capacity and flexibility to respond to another global financial crisis. What are you going to do, pump even more liquidity into the system? Uh, it doesn't seem to me to make much sense. And most fiscal policies are still pretty much out of line with significant budget deficits and high levels of public sector debt. Although in some countries, like the United States and Australia, household debt is a bigger, much bigger problem than public sector debt. Um, against that, we've had a loss of faith and trust in politicians, a loss of faith in traditional parties, um, a loss of faith in some institutions, some of the key policy-making institutions, and in the governing and political class. And that's shown up in various ways in various elections across Europe, the United States and Australia in the last few years. And significant groups of voters, uh, I think, feel a bit left behind, disenfranchised, forgotten, ignored. And uh, this is a very significant constraint now in public policy. So somebody like a Trump can appeal to that particular constituency. I think it was the grumpy old white, low to middle income males in the United States initially who hadn't seen an increase in their standard of living for a couple of decades. Uh, and then he could build a political strategy on the back of that appeal, even though what he's promised, he has no capacity to deliver, as we're seeing. Um, so against all that, there's been a very significant questioning uh, and um, 
a rethink, if you like, of capitalism and its sustainability, of neoliberalism, which is basically been identified as the, the core um, ideological drive, if you like, of a lot of public policy in the last several decades, and even questioning now of democracy. Uh, it's been essentially taken as a given for a long time, and so I think it's an article of faith, really, that capitalism, free markets and democracy go hand in hand. Uh, but uh, now there's a very strong global sentiment that's very heavily nationalistic, specifically ethno-nationalistic, particularly in Europe. It's anti-immigration and pro-protection. So we risk undoing, threaten to undo all that was good, all, the, all that was achieved in a positive sense over most of the post-war period through globalisation. And uh, I think the costs of stepping back on that would be very significant. So it's against that background, I think, that this book is, is very important because it does not only raise some of these issues, but it focuses in on some particular aspects of the policy challenges that exist. Um, Stephen, my call for a new mindset and an approach in terms of economic policy. And clearly economists have got a lot to, um, <laughs> and policymakers have got a lot to answer for, a lot of challenges. I mean, a lot of the economic theory we used to take for granted really doesn't seem to apply anymore. I, mean, I remember decades of debates about monetarism and the fact that if you flooded the world with liquidity, you risk runaway inflation. Well, we've had two serious bouts of liquidity since the early 2000s. One was under Greenspan, where he flooded the world with liquidity, kept uh, US interest rates down too low for too long, if you like, and the whole world just exploded looking for yield and debt instruments were created, which changed the nature of the, uh, the risk, they thought, reparceled the risk, rebadged it. But when the music stopped, of course, the whole house of cards, the whole mountain of debt collapsed when the subprime loans didn't meet uh, their expectations. And so economists uh, would have said that that was a period where you would have got runaway inflation. We had a, instead a global financial crisis. And what was the response to the global financial crisis? to flood the world with even more liquidity and uh, to somehow hope that uh, doing the same thing again uh, would give you different results. I think Einstein called that insanity, but um, <laughs> that has been the approach, is even more liquidity. And in that they've built, central banks have built very large balance sheets and very low interest rates. They kept interest rates low for a very long period of time, uh, sometimes uh, significantly negative, uh, even out as to the 10-year bonds in, say, countries like Germany sustained periods of negative interest rates. And I remember when I was a PhD student at Johns Hopkins, in those days, in the early 70s, we were all building macro models of the world solving the world's problems. And um, one of my colleagues' macro model implied a period of negative interest rates. And the learned professors, who were among the leading, world's leading in monetary uh, um, macro and econometric professors, in their wisdom threw his thesis out on the basis it was inconceivable that you could sustain a period of negative interest rates. And, um, you know, yet here we've had a dominance of negative interest rate experiences in Europe, parts of the United States, certainly in Japan, uh, and uh, that's really challenged the economics profession in a significant way. And, uh, you know, rather than it stimulating growth and, and uh, accelerating inflation, it's actually seen pretty much a stagnation of growth, a lot of talk about secular stagnation of growth, with the prospect that the developed world will now not grow much more than two, two and a half percent for the next decade or so. And that's a very significant challenge, I think, for the economic profession. At the same time, you've had privatisations that have been poorly handled, competition policies that have failed, tax concessions that have been exploited, and many government programs that haven't achieved the desired objectives or weren't uh, at all cost effective in chasing those objectives. So this is a very challenging time, I think, for economists and policymakers to rethink uh, some of the values that they've held, some of the beliefs they've held, if you like, some of the policy prescriptions that they've favoured. So Mike and Steve actually emphasise that distributional issues must become the critical dimension in economic policy. And although they concede, of course, that the issue of inequality is much more pronounced in other parts of the world, and we see it conspicuously say in the United States, it is an issue in Australia, is becoming more of an issue. There's too much focus on market efficiency, there's been too much focus on supply side economics, too much weight placed on 
you know, the assumptions that benefits will trickle down from policy changes when in fact the evidence isn't there that they do. So the uh, call from uh, Stephen Mike is for a shift to the demand side, more focus on the link between wages, productivity growth and national disposable income and on improvements in the tax transfer system with a renewed focus on low income earners, what they call I guess collectively as inclusive growth, an inclusive growth strategy. I think that's worth thinking about. They call as a result of that for a whole range of different policy changes and you know, there are many but to pick out a few, increased rent assistance and reducing the gap between benefits and pensions, more equitable funding of social, uh, sorry, school education, improved funding and delivery of vocational education and training which has really in this country fallen off the pace. Changes in the planning system to allow higher densities in established suburbs to improve housing affordability and reduce spatial inequality for the better access of jobs and quality services. Need for broad-based tax reform, although a warning, I think, that if you take a view over the next three decades, you should expect that the tax burden in aggregate will go up. We'll need to go up by about three percentage points of GDP over three decades. That may be an underestimate. <laughs> if you look at the sort of commitments that are being made by governments of both persuasions that carry well into the 2020s, and beyond, all of them unfunded. Clearly they say we need a new public debate in Australia. It's crying out for a new direction and for new bold leadership to build an Australia's, to build on our, I should say, Australia's strong tradition of a fair go of e and equality of opportunity. Um, in those terms, I think this book is a must read. Anyone who's serious about rethinking some of the, the, the uh, Errors of the past, if you like, and uh, the process by which we should go to the future and what uh, reform, what would be the key elements of reform to get us there, I think this book will be an invaluable read. When I look back at my time, I've seen some potentially good policies badly implemented. I mean, Privatisation is a classic case where it was mostly driven by governments chasing revenue. The over, overarching objective was let's get as much as we can in selling the power assets in Victoria or Powers and Wiles in New South Wales or the Commonwealth Bank or whatever. And there was no thought given at the time to the desirable competitive market structure into which you would be selling those assets. There was a complete disconnect between the desire for government to top up its revenue and sometimes under serious budget constraints, the budget repair was a, an important consideration. But there was no consideration given to what you end up going, going to end up and create. So in the energy area, for example, we've got gen tailors now. One desire was to keep generators and distributors and retailers separate. Now we've got big, three big companies that dominate the market and they both only gen, not only generate power but they also retail it. So they can gouge the wholesale market, they can gouge the retail market and we all pay increasingly high electricity and gas prices as a consequence. And that was all based on the initial privatisation of large parts of that sector and some significant elements of that, including, say, the distribution system in some states are now foreign owned as well. So um, privatisation in itself may have been a sensible policy strategy in the context of budget repair, but the way it was done and the neglect of other policy areas, I think, has been a very significant constraint uh, <clears throat> Another area that gets a lot of attention in politics these days is welfare, welfare spending. A lot of attention has been given to the better targeting of welfare. And, um, you know, I get annoyed when I see at one level a focus on, you know, an attack, another, yet another attack on welfare fraud or welfare abuse. And there has been some and there has been found, but it amounts to a few million dollars. At the same time, there's absolutely no comparable scrutiny of defence procurement strategies, for example, that may cost billions, may lose, in fact, billions, tens of billions, in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, that inconsistency in the attitude to welfare, I think, is very important, and the attitude to government expenditure as a whole is very important. But also in the welfare area, and this picks up a bit of what Steve and Mike would be talking about, is that we've lost sight of what those benefits are meant to do. Um, sure, we need to establish genuine need by targeting and Australia is internationally recognised, I think, as having one of the most effective uh, welfare targeting systems in the world. 
yet we've lost sight of the level of the benefits. And it's true today, I think, that Newstart, the unemployment benefit example, and the base pension are way below any estimate of the poverty line. So if you want to create inequality, you do it in the way you pursue that sort of welfare agenda. And unfortunately, both sides of politics have done that. And they've, in, in doing that, they've also stayed away from some of the big areas uh, where you might uh, make a substantial contribution to the budget by, say, bringing, in some sense, the family home into the determination of pension entitlements. You see them back off some of those more difficult decisions quite quickly. So we're probably getting the worst of all worlds in that, in that area, I suspect. And in the context of budget repair, as I said, I mean, I am very worried. I look at the budget numbers that came out in May of last year. Uh, we're told we will have a surplus in 2021. It's an assumed surplus. It assumes that wages will increase dramatically, uh, nearly double their rate of increase, if you like, within the four-year period to get us the tax base that's required to get us the surplus. Yet at the same time, there have been very, very heavy expenditure commitments made in education and health, the NDIS, defence, infrastructure, carrying well into the 2020s and beyond that are largely unfunded. And so the political constraints in there are very real. Uh, and uh, it doesn't surprise me, as I said before, that uh, Steve and Mike are talking about the need to be realistic, to recognise that the tax base will need to go up. Uh, while tax reform is an important challenge in this country, um, overall it may be in the context of increasing the tax burden rather than just reducing it. Now, unfortunately, politics today has just sort of got this link between tax reform and lower taxes, which has got to be broken if you're going to have a sensible debate about tax. It's also a very difficult area in politics these days. Um, politics today is very much a game, a short-term game. In fact, Keating told me I should have realised that before the 93 election. <laughs> he said, don't you understand? He said, John, that to me, politics is just a game and I'll say I'll do whatever I have to do to win. I'd never thought of politics as a game. <laughs> I thought of it as a pretty serious business, there's no doubt about it. Um, but uh, it's become incredibly uh, much more of a game, I guess, uh, since then. Um, it's alarmingly short-term, opportunistic, populist, mostly negative, and sometimes, unfortunately, very personal. And it's not the sort of environment where you can actually hope to get sensible public policy debate or the sensible development of policy within the bureaucracy and beyond the bureaucracy or um, pass it through the parliamentary processes. In that sort of very short-term environment, it's very difficult. And you see what happens, uh, the Labor Party recently has announced a couple of tax measures. Um, we should have a look at negative gearing from the point of view of housing affordability. The immediate government response is up, Labor's new housing tax. We'll run a scare campaign on that and we won't debate the detail. Uh, similarly, more recently, the changes uh, to the um, cash payments in relation to franking um, credits. Now, the interesting thing is there that if you were doing genuine broad-based reform, that would probably be all elements of a package. But to do any one of them in isolation, you'll isolate a constituency immediately, the other side will oppose it, and you won't get anywhere. And that's unfortunately where we've, we've, uh, we've ended up. And um, I think, for, personally, I think we have, well, I thought in early 90s that we needed dramatic reform and fight back in, in the 90s had a detailed policy position in uh, every single area of public policy. That was my aim. Thousands of pages of policy detail. But because I lost, it's now seen as the longest political suicide note in history. <laughs> but we need to move away from short-termism. We need to move towards medium to long-term structural planning. It's taken us decades to create a housing crisis in this country. It's going to take us quite a number of years to turn that around. There are no silver bullets anymore. And the same in any other area of public policy. There's a genuine need in public policy for, more ref for genuine reform, broad-based reform, but in the current climate, it's very difficult to see any of that being done by in the development stage, including the public policy debate that would be required in the public to get some of those issues accepted, the options put on the table, and governments and oppositions to take clear-cut policy positions about them. The probability of that seems very low. Um, I guess two final comments. So one is perhaps we, in order to have any genuine reform, we need to st start by cleaning up politics. You know, do something about uh, campaign funding and lobbying, do something about uh, 
about the pre-selection processes, do something about the parliament, the conduct of the parliament, uh, uh, parliamentary processes and so on. Now, these are things that they all know they can do, but they don't do them. They don't clean up campaign funding, for example, because each side figures they can do it better than the other, they can exploit it better than the other, so we don't actually make any real progress. And when circumstances arise and everyone gets embarrassed about how bad it is, they all agree and then proceed to do nothing. The second comment is to just make a couple of positive suggestions in relation to distribution impacts of public policy, which I think are very important. The first thing is that what's always worried me, and Mike, you've had the experience in finance and treasury over the years, but what's always worried me is there isn't a regular, maybe even annual assessment of government, major government programs when they've been implemented. Are they working to achieve the objectives? Are they cost effective? What are the distribution and other consequences of what you've done? And that doesn't get looked at. And if the tendency uh, of short-term politics is not to solve problems, but to kick issues down the road, it ultimately takes a lot longer and costs a lot more to turn those around. And the second thing is I think that the distributional imp impacts are very important. Um, the inequality that's created by some government initiatives, which is not recognised at the time, uh, can be very significant. So I would suggest that perhaps all Cabinet submissions of, on uh, new uh, significant policy initiatives should be accompanied by an inequality impact statement where the government departments, the politicians, the ministers are required to think about the likely impacts, social impacts more broadly if you like, but distributional impacts in particular. So an inequality impact statement I think would be an important, important move forward. One final comment is uh, I noticed on the agenda here I was given 15 minutes <laughs> and you gave me 35. <laughs> so we, we are productive. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yes, I should have checked the most recent version. Uh, you, were, you were brought back to, into the fold of uh, a shorter uh, time allocation, which you've kept to delightfully. Thank you. Um, what we'll do is now uh, invite Stephen and then Mike to talk here, and then all our contributors can sit up after that up, up there for the, uh, the Q&A, just so that they know where they're headed and when they're headed. Uh, so if I could uh, ask Stephen now to come and uh, talk to us for a little while. Well, um, thanks, John, for those um, very interesting and insightful comments. Somewhat, somewhat gloomy about politics, but uh, let's, hope, let's hope you're wrong. Um, look, I used to sit around before um, I wrote this book with Mike in a fairly confused um, state, and I was well aware as a professor of political economy that there were a hell of a lot of big things happening um, in, in the world. And, I couldn't figure out what the connections were, how they fitted together, uh, and so on. And I must say, <laughs> writing this book with Mike has been a revelation in a whole bunch of ways, but it's, it's helped me figure out at least um, some of these big things and some of the connections between them. So the things I've got in mind, and John mentioned some of them, but I'll read them out. So we've got globalisation, um, uh, relentless um, economic restructuring, um, technological change, changing labour markets and, and rising employment um, insecurity, um, increasing income and wealth inequality, uh, large international macroeconomic imbalances, uh, financialisation or the rise of um, huge financial exchanges nationally uh, and internationally, um, in relation asset price and, and property booms and busts, financial instability and serial financial crises culminating in 2008 and, and who knows what next, uh, rising public and private debt, government fiscal challenges, uh, national macroeconomic instability, weak investment and productivity growth, low wages growth, um, slowing economic growth, um, and the attendant um, political discontent, populist backlash and, and the sort of grinding down in the political cycle leading to quite a lot of um, cynicism. All, all those things are happening and, and Mike and I uh, argue that one way of 
slicing through those and, in a sense, joining them up, um, is to see them as the result of um, competing income claims uh, in the economy. We think there's a common driver linking these sorts of issues together and um, distributional conflict and competing income claims um, we think are central and we think they've always been central uh, to capitalist democracies. We've had periods in history where they've been handled quite well, the post-war era was one, but we think since the 1970s we've handled them badly and we've yet to come to grips with how we deal with competing income claims in particular and how we divvy up the economic pie. We've tried various escape routes um, to this challenge and dilemma since the 1970s. Um, primarily in the 70s, inflation and stagflation, which is basically um, uh, rising uh, wage and price spirals. Essentially, extracting um, more from the economy through, through force and, and reaching into the economy and pulling out uh, incomes on either side, labour and capital, driving an inflationary cycle. Um, that was catastrophic and, and was wound back um, by the early 80s in the lead economies, um, by the early 90s in this economy. We tried a more uh, s slower, softer, more balanced approach, arguably. Um, as inflation was being wound down, uh, we opted in the Western economies for another, in a sense, escape route from these underlying dilemmas. And that escape route has been rising um, government, corporate um, and household debt. Uh, and that rising debt has been channeled into various um, areas um, in financial markets into uh, a huge um, debt fueled um, asset uh, boom which collapsed in 2008 and we're still living with the consequences of that. Um, in, uh, in government debt ballooning around uh, the world, less so in Australia. Um, and in terms of the household sector, household debt driving up uh, property prices uh, into a, um, a worrying, perhaps unsustainable housing boom. Um, these are all dynamics of essentially trying to comp uh, reach into the economy and, and, and extract resources that essentially aren't there uh, in an attempt to deal with these underlying problems. Um, we, think, we think after three decades of these sorts of attempts, we're reaching a point now where we've, exa we've exhausted these sorts of escape routes and we're, we're confronting a new challenge where these underlying problems are actually crystallising and we, in a sense, are having to confront them because we've run out of other options. And the underlying problems, if you, if you cut them really narrowly, are essentially, we think, um, inequality, uh, wealth and income, as a result of changing labour markets, um, driving um, weak um, wages growth as labour markets change, driving weak um, um, aggregate demand, uh, driving slow economic growth. And that's compounded um, in terms of um, aggregate demand, high debt levels in the household sector in particular. So um, a slow growth future, as John mentioned, um, makes dealing with these sorts of distributional conflicts and dilemmas more difficult. Um, and we think at the moment we're, in a sense, confronting a whole new paradigm of economic policy which has to be rapidly brought into place because the old paradigm is essentially failing and it's demonstrably failing right now. Now, we argue that Australia's actually done a lot better and we, we compare Australia in these terms with Western Europe um, the United States in particular, some reference to Japan and China, etc. We think we've done a lot better, but even here we're confronting these dilemmas uh, much more starkly now. Um, in the last three decades in this country and Western countries more generally, um, the focus has been on essentially the supply side in terms of boosting efficiencies and productivity through market-based reforms increased competition, deregulation, etc. cetera. Uh, that, that neoliberal supply side agenda in many ways was a good idea. Um, um, the Labor governments in the 80s and 90s in particular exploited those policies effectively and cushioned their impact through um, 
things like social wages and other forms of support from the state. We did neoliberal reforms in this country quite well. We argue in the book that the neoliberal agenda has essentially run its course. Um, as John mentioned, the focus now, we think, needs to be on the demand side and dealing primarily with issues of, of uh, inequality and the other issues I mentioned. If we're going to change our policy focus fundamentally, we need a much more active and enlightened public debate than we've had. Our book is designed to help contribute to that debate. But ultimately we get to the point where um, we need to you know, confront the political um, um, shortcomings and, and dysfunctions and frustrations that, that John was talking about. Um, Mike and I have written a chapter recently, which I think we both found enlightening in some ways, reviewing economic policy for the last two centuries in this country and emphasising the role of the state in particular in terms of bringing forward major um, restructuring and uh, improvements in the economy. And it wasn't that long ago, I don't think, in the 80s and 90s that we had pretty effective policy making. And Mike was central to that policy making. Um, and it's bewildering when you think of, we were doing it very well then in many ways. And now, here and now, we're confronting this uh, very frustrating political malaise and one wonders what the hell's happened. Um, it's essential that we fix this problem the, the first challenge is, as John said, we've got to fix politics, otherwise we'll get nowhere with the policy agenda that Mike and I are advancing. So there's a whole chapter in the book, uh, the end chapter, on governance, uh, and we rehearse and discuss a lot of the things that John mentioned. We don't have any silver bullets, I'm afraid, um, but we'll have to invent them. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to begin by thanking in particular John Hewson uh, for his remarks. I'd also like to thank um, Glenn and Meredith Edwards, who I can't see, but I know she's here, there, <laughs> uh, who, can't, when you buy the book, you'll uh, see their favourable comments on the book and thank them in particular. Um, John and John Houston's given you the overall theme of the book and Steve's done that, elaborated that. Um, I won't try and do another overview of the book. Rather, what I'll use my time to do is to emphasise a few points that I think are particularly important. Um, doesn't mean the other ones that I won't say aren't important, but just that it seem to be to me to be particularly important, I suppose, as an economist. Um, this book, uh, as Steve mentioned, focuses on Australia, but unlike a lot of books by economists on Australia, it looks a lot at the rest of the world um, and looks at the evidence regarding the rest of the world. Uh, so it's very much a comparative text and our contention is that if you want to look at where Australia may be going, it's not a, you obviously look at Australia's past, but it's a good idea to look at what's been happening in other countries. Uh, and they may, you know, there but for the grace of God go we. Um, so Australia's done especially well, and I think in large measure that is thanks to the past reforms, uh, which did improve the supply side. But as Steve said, they were done very much with a focus on helping the losers. Reforms do involve losers. And it was, uh, it was very much a focus on helping the losers. And that seems to have been lost sight of a bit in recent times. Uh, perhaps one outstanding feature of Australia's good performance Everybody refers to the fact we haven't had a recession for more than a quarter of a century. That's true. And we're practically the only developed country you can say that of. 
But another critical success has been if you take the period since the last recession back in 1991 till today, wages have more or less over the whole period, the 20, <coughs> 25 years or so, have grown in line with productivity. Now, you'd say, well, that's what you'd expect. As an economist, that's what ex economists expect. But it's not true in most countries. Um, between 1991 and 2008, in 16 out of 22 advanced, o the advanced OECD countries, real wages did not increase as fast as productivity. Indeed, the gap between the respective growth rates of real wages and productivity was as much as one percentage point per annum uh, over that whole period in 10 of the countries. And, the, and that sort of gap has persi persisted uh, after the GFC in six countries and in uh, most of the advanced countries since the GFC, again, wages haven't kept pace with productivity. Um, now, that's obviously going to give you a growing share of return to capital and a diminishing share of return to labour. Uh, and that has consequences for the economy. But even more important has been the increasing inequality within the distribution of earnings. And so much of the gains in the distribution of earnings have gone to the top 10% or even the top 1%. Uh, to take the extreme example, I think John Hewson mentioned that uh, you know, the typical male wage earner hasn't had a real increase uh, for the last couple of decades. In fact, the typical, the lower six deciles in the wage distribution are getting lower real wages now than they were 45 years ago. So much for the American dream that if you work hard, you'll get ahead. They're getting less than their grandfathers. Um, <clears throat> another aspect that I think is worth mentioning is that the inequality of opportunity that is emerging in this country. Uh, until the 1970s, it didn't matter where you lived in Australia, you had the same chance of being employed. Now, Bob Gregory showed quite a long time ago that that changed in Australia. And there are very big differences in employment participation according to where you live now. Differences of 10 percentage of points for males. And similarly with education, uh, the quality of education varies very substantially, in including the resourcing of it, according to where you live. And both of those two facts impact on the quality, future quality of opportunity. Um, the second point I want to make is, has already been made really, is that if incomes don't grow, uh, then demand's unlikely to grow as fast as potential output. And as Steve mentioned, we postponed that problem up to the GFC by demand growing faster than incomes, but only by households going into debt. This is true in many countries, but most obviously in America. The con what we, while we would concede that an economy can be either wage or profit-led, and there's some evidence that uh, in the period of stagflation, and particularly in Australia where we had a big real wage overhang, uh, the Australian economy may have been profit-led in that period. Certainly in the last few decades, most economies have been wage-led. You have to have a very big export sector, like 50% of your GDP, for it to be likely to be profit-led. And uh, so that in turn means that investment depends mainly on demand. Uh, you know, if, if investment depended on profit rates, we'd have a lot of investment. Profits are sky high. We've had a big shift to profit. 
Um, but what are they doing with all these profits that they're getting? They're returning them to shareholders. Uh, since 2002, non-financial companies in the US have for the first time become net lenders. In all previous history, the corporate sector was a net borrower. That is to say, it invested more than the money it made out, at, more than the, it from, could get from its profits and borrowed you know, from households or overseas or whatever. Now, for the first time, you know, they're net lenders. So, and since 2013, they've returned more funds to shareholders than they've spent on real capital investment. So they're actually returning more funds to shareholders through share buybacks and dividends than they're actually spending on new investment. In that context, a tax cut won't help at all. Indeed, um, in the first six weeks of this year, no doubt in response to the Trump tax cuts, US companies announced a record $171 billion worth of share buybacks. In the first six weeks of this year, $171 billion worth of share buybacks. That's more than double the $76 billion that they announced for the same period last year. That's what they did with the Trump tax cut. They gave even more back to shareholders. They didn't go in for real investment. And let me add that while the US is the extreme outlier, there are a lot of other developed countries that are doing the same thing. I can pick in particular Canada, UK and Japan. So what are the policy implications of our conclusion that distributional issues matter a lot? far more than the economic literature's ever given consideration to. We think that you need to consider the cause of inequality if you're going to develop good policies. Um, and that we, in the book we go through the various causes, but the principal cause of inequality in earnings for most people is technology. It doesn't explain the top 1%, but it explains, it's the most important. It's technological change, which has particularly hollowed out middle level jobs. Um, the routine jobs of operatives, uh, both, in both in factories or machinery, but also things like typists. The typing pools no longer exist. We all do our own typing. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, but the next point I want to make is that uh, the technologies that we're all ad ad adapt adopting, they're pretty much the same in all the developed countries. You know, we all you know, took up with the internet about the same time and, and so on. But uh, the differences in inequality are quite different the change in inequality is quite different between different countries. And our conclusion from that is that policy really makes a difference. And I'll just give you the example, comparison of Australia and the US. Now, in the US, the premium for having a university degree uh, has more than doubled in the last 30 years. But guess what? there are no more university degrees than there were 30 years ago. It's very expensive to get a degree, uh, very risky in terms of your loans that you have to take on and so on. And so even though the, pre the premium has doubled in response to a shortage of skills. Whereas in Australia, the premium is much the same as it was 30 years ago, but the number of students has massively increased. <laughs> and the number of number of degrees have massively increased. So that policy of skilling has made a real and very major difference to earnings inequality in Australia relative to the US. Um, as Steve said very specifically, we think we need to reconsider the economic model or economic paradigm on which a lot of policy Australia is based. Um, 
That's not unusual. When we experience stagflation, uh, essentially we change the model to a supply side model and away from the Keynesian demand model because fundamentally we thought Keynesianism no longer worked. It was found on a trade-off between inflation and unemployment and there was no such trade-off under stagflation. Well, I think we're at a similar turning point now that uh, while the, not that we want to abandon the supply side model, but it's not that, as Steve said, we think the agenda is largely complete um, and certainly, uh, and there's not going to be huge breakthroughs in the future on that front. But it's also not really directed to the problems of today, which is not a shortage of potential output, but a shortage of demand. Um, let me also say that uh, that supply side model essentially assumes income distribution issues out of the, out of the equation. It's basically found on a neoclassical growth model which assumes uh, neutral technological progress. Well, that ain't happening. It assumes constant returns to scale, whereas we know that's not right. And it assumes perfect competition, and we know that there's a lot of rent seeking. Um, so it's not surprising to me that uh, economic growth, which involves structural change and transformation, can change the distribution of income. That's been true, shown to be true since the Industrial Revolution, but it didn't, we didn't change the distribution of income very much in the lead up to adopting the neoclassical growth model and the supply side uh, reforms. Um, I can see Glenn looking at his watch, I'll speed up. <laughs> um, now, in terms of what we should do from here on, we don't want to stop technological change, obviously. Uh, we couldn't if we wanted to, but you know, it wouldn't be very smart to lag behind the rest of the world, deprive ourselves of electric cars, etc. Um, so we'll, we'll, future policy will need to uh, give continuing support to innovation and technological progress. But we want to ensure that that doesn't come at a cost to inequality. And our basic view is that the future reform agenda must therefore focus on education and training so that we develop the skills and the opportunities for people that they can adapt uh, to the continuing technological change. And we're early adopters of new change and so on. So we put a lot of emphasis on education, training and skills. We think that will improve uh, future income distribution and quality, but it will also improve both the supply and demand sides of the economy. Um, I'd also like to mention that we want to, we put a lot of store by restore, on restoring the equality of opportunity. And here I'm particularly conscious of spatial inequality. Uh, it's the spatial inequality that worries us most about future equality of opportunity. In this context, the Gonski reforms are extremely important. I think it's the credit of the present minister, Simon Birmingham, that he has done his best to push them through. Um, but it also means that future urban planning and housing policy are extremely important if we want to get uh, better uh, spatial equality and Finally, as John Houston mentioned, the reforms will cost money. Uh, the present government's own intergeneration report predicts a deficit, budget deficit of 6% 6, 6 of GDP in 2055, and if you think we should be aiming for a surplus of about 1% of GDP, then you've got to basically save 7% of GDP, uh, and a bit more because we're not starting from a balance. 
And uh, I've never seen anyone find that sort of savings on the expenditure side. Uh, not even Tony Abbott's reforms would have got even with it a bull's roar of that, and people didn't like them. So it seems to me that an increase in revenue as a share of GDP is inevitable. And uh, at the moment, both political parties are talking about tax cuts. You know, as soon as we can afford them, we deserve them. Uh, well, we also think we deserve governments that provide uh, some very essential services and provide them in a way that ensures that we stay a decent and fair country. And we really need to have a national conversation about exactly what we expect of government and then how we're going to pay for it. Thank you. Well, colleagues, we're running a little out of time. Uh, John was under and uh, Mike was over. We must have a trading system going on, some sort of uh, time and trading system for, for that, as opposed to authoritarian allocation of time. So let's uh, open up quickly now for uh, any, any questions, please, for our three uh, eminent. Uh, I wondered whether the panellists would have any comment on two issues that I've been interested in watching. The first of all, the universal basic income debate uh, and whether uh, that should be promoted in Australia as a serious possibility. And the second, the discussions that George Monbiot's been having saying, we, we, we got to the global financial crisis and there wasn't a, comp a compelling alternative story as there was when uh, in the stagflation period in the 70s when uh, the neoliberals were very well organised. And I wonder whether you feel there is a compelling alternative story, as Monbiot says, that he talks about this, uh, uh, this alternative uh, politics of inclusion. Looks like Mike's keen on that one. Yeah, I'll only go the first one. I'll give it to my colleagues the second one, which is actually more challenging, I think. So I'll take the easy one. Um, uh, universal basic income, we talk about it in the book and dismiss it, to be frank. Uh, it would cost, very simply, you'd have to have an average tax rate of 45% to give people a decent universal an income which would cover people with no other income and, but give it to billionaires as well. So, you know, you'd, it's just not practical. Indeed, it goes completely counter to one of the great strengths of Australia. Um, John said we have a very targeted system. We have the most effectively targeted income security system in the world. And that is a real strength. We, we achieve massive redistribution compared to other countries. Yes, um, look, we, we're um, uh, against the basic income idea, the universal basic income idea, but there's, it costs a lot of money, but there's, there's another reason. Um, and here I'll inject a bit of um, you know, upbeatness and optimism or whatever, because the, Australia's been historically an incredibly successful economy. Um, it's still a successful economy in many ways. The, the problems that are plaguing the United States and, and parts of Europe are far more severe than we've got here. We think we're entering this sort of zone of, of difficulty. We're not in the middle of it. And, and now's the time to take action to avoid the worst case scenarios that we're seeing unfolding um, in the US. Now, um, we actually think the policy changes we're recommending are actually not assuming we can fix the politics and get parties and governments to kind of go out there and, and sell you know, strong policies. But the, the policies are actually not that complicated. Um, our policy agenda is, is almost, I wouldn't say conservative, but it's, it's, it's quite straightforward in the sense that we need to boost education and skill formation. And we're doing a much better job in the United States by far even now, but we need to go another level up again. We need to deal with some of the issues of housing and spatial inequality that Mike talked about. 
we need uh, a bit more fiscal grunt from government, and that's a bit more taxation increase, but it's not a radical tax agenda. I know it's different from the one we're operating on, but it's not a radical tax agenda in the sense that we don't really need to raise vast amounts of new revenue to fund the sorts of proposals we're talking about. Um, so I, I actually think uh, we, can, we can hopefully uh, chart a new course and, and, and actually achieve these things. We certainly have in the past um, in terms of running a successful economy. I, I hope we can do it again. Uh, in terms of the compelling agenda you talked about post-2008, where is it? I, I think we spent a decade hoping we could get back to where we were and it's not working. We're not going to get back to where we were. Um, we're, we're grinding into the sand, in a sense, in terms of growth models and distributional issues that we're starkly now confronting. This is why we wrote the book. Um, and this is why we think it's an important book, because it is changing the conversation, hopefully. And hopefully it will be successful in terms of motivating a new type of policy debate. Uh, thanks. Look, I don't want to comment specifically on universal basic income. I think what they've, they've said is right. But just in terms of my desire for medium-term thinking and planning, let's take a worst-case scenario where secular, the growth in the developed world stays with the two in front of it, low twos, for decades, that wages stay flat, that underemployment rises, that inflation stays low, that interest rates stay low, isn't there going to be phenomenal interest in some form of basic financial support for workers generally? Whatever form that takes, I think there's an inevitability about that. What worries me about the policy debate today is there isn't that, as you said, Bob, a well-articulated alternative. I think there's um, a very strong desire to try and patch up what we've got. And maybe what we need to do is have a blank piece of paper and, and start again. Try to not, you know, I don't like labels, I don't like Keynesian versus Montreux versus whatever, uh, neoliberal. But um, I think we've got a lot of work done and a lot of research in a lot of countries that you have the basic evidence you need to maybe fill in that blank piece of paper. Some of these questions may be from the same zone. I noticed another hand went up when the universal basic income was mentioned. And I'm a little bit in the zone of the previous questioner. You said you have a chapter on governance, but you've spoken very much as economists with your thinking framing, framed by an economic view of things, and you haven't really spoken about governance. So I'm looking forward to reading the book to see what you have to say. Um, I've recently read the new book by Derek Wall on um, Eleanor Ostrom. It's actually his third book about her. But he's trying to argue that her work on the commons could provide a new model for thinking about governance um, instead of from the top down, from local upwards, that you reform at the local level and carry on up. And that through reforming governance, you reform the economy and not the other way about. I guess this is another governance, governance kind of question, but it's a political question. John focused in particular on the lack of leadership and we're all focused on major economic reforms. So the circuit breaker politically uh, needs to be found. Do you think there's any chance that we could attach that circuit breaker to a head of state for a republic and give that head of state resources and institutions that would allow them to influence the politics that goes on in the houses? So we attach commissions of the future, climate um, institutes, indigenous institutes to a head of state with enough influence to really make fundamental changes to the way politics is thought of by the houses. Okay. An idea for you to respond to and the last question. Thank you. Um, we are heading into a period of massive technological change and it's probably not unreasonable to at least consider the scenario where in maybe, to pick a number, 20 years from now, 30% of the population, working, potentially working population, will be unemployed, unemployable, in fact, no matter how much education we provide. If not a universal basic income, uh, have you, in the book, considered other possible uh, ways of dealing with this issue? OK, thank you. Now back to the panel for some last reflections on the questions and 
Anything else they want to get in before we break? Look, I'll, uh, I'll take... I'll t I'll try and take the governance questions. It's a really, you know, as, as we know, this is a really difficult area because, because we've seen what's happened in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years in terms of the way governments around the world are operating and the kind of worrying trends that John, John mentioned. Look, I, I'll, come, I'll come back to the, the, the kind of um, standard argument and it's, it sounds slightly banal, but it, it's what Mike and I believe, is that what's lacking is, uh, is, is vision or enough vision and leadership. Uh, I'll, re I'll repeat that, that I don't think the challenges for this country, I think, I think it's different for the United States, but for this country, because we're, I think we're starting off a very high base in terms of capacity and, and, and what we've achieved. So I actually think um, a strong leadership, but that can't come without a vision and we don't have the vision yet. We, we haven't changed the economic debate in this country. We're, we're still running with um, um, essentially a supply side, you know, wage flexibility, tax cuts for business, you know, these sorts of things, which, which won't achieve a great deal. We've already got a flexible labour market, etc. We, we need, a, we need a, a new mode of discussion and thinking and the leadership to take that forward. And, and reform, as Mike well knows, beyond that is really about, which we've done successfully in the past, is about picking up those who are disadvantaged and the losers from reform processes and bringing them with them. That's how you build a coalition for, a political coalition for change. It's, it's not rocket science. We've, we've done it before. Um, on, on the point about having a, an empowered or more empowered or whatever head of state, um, I, I don't find that very attractive at the moment because you know we've already got. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're a democratic system. Um, we've already got an independent monetary policy operating. I, I don't want to see an independent something else going on as well that, that further weakens the parliament and the traditional political system. I think the comment before about more more bottom up input would be worthwhile, but in the end, you still need, I think, major political parties and major governmental institutions to drive change and working into, you know, up, up and down the hierarchy of society to the state is a good idea. We certainly need a lot, a lot more of the bottom end stuff in, say, water reform in this country uh, to help that process gain more legitimacy, etc. So anyway, I'll, I'll, repeat, I'll repeat the basic theme that, that we're talking about. The, the, cha the challenges are there, but they're not overwhelming challenges. Um, and I think we can achieve them um, if we can reboot the sort of political capacity we had not that long ago. John next or...? John. Okay, there's, look, there are a lot of elements to those three questions. Um, I think economists easily forget that what we're about is reforming society, not just the economy and dimensions beyond that are very important and quite often neglected in a lot of the debate. Um, it is a temptation to say when you see something not getting done that we'll have an independent commission to handle that. I've been involved in a couple of those. I think I wrote a paper back in 1980 advocating an independent reserve bank uh, based on market determined interest rates and exchange rates. And that came out of just constant frustration sitting in the Fraser cabinet watching politicians set interest rates and exchange rates, and four of the seven that made that decision were farmers. So they never thought it was a great idea to put the exchange rate up or, you know, interest rates up. And so you needed to change that system. And right now, when you can't get genuine tax reform or genuine federation reform on the expenditure side, there's an enormous desire, I think, to have a, a tax commission that is independent. Um, we're looking at, uh, and you at an exercise of a commission for the future where the major existential threats to the future of the planet are considered and obviously, uh, you know, there are a number of those that are important and that's something that probably has to be taken out of government. I mean, the basic mentality here is if you can't trust the politicians to do it, you better set up a structure that, 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 that may do it. The difficulty that I have, though, linking it, say, to the Republican movement is, you know, that movement failed simply on one issue at the time, which was whether or not we should vote for or be able to vote for the head of state or whether it should be appointed by some sort of parliamentary structure. 
Uh, we didn't have the second big issue as a matter of that debate, was what powers that head of state should have. The assumption was it would be largely ceremonial, I think. But so once you get into that debate, it is so difficult. There are so many vested interests that you might actually lose the entire argument. I do think, though, that the electorate is very keen to give new governments a chance. And if they come with some notional vision, they give them support. I mean, Rudd got a lot of support in 2007 and the expectation he was going to break away from the way Howard had run the place. And then he faltered fairly early on, to a couple of years later, and uh, that was the beginning of his end. Abbott came in with great enthusiasm, federation reform, tax reform. That didn't last very long. Uh, he uh, didn't handle that very well, couldn't make the transition from opposition to government. Turnbull came in with massive expectation. He's a guy that believes in same-sex marriage, climate change, you know, tax reform, whatever. And ever since he's done none of that, and so he's had the biggest and fastest fall in personal poll standing in our history. But I think if, if somebody does arrive with a view and is prepared to argue it, a vision, and is prepared to argue it and, and put policies forward and debate them, not just one day, sustain it over a long period of time, I think the electorate will cut them a lot of slack. And until you get that, you won't get much, much uh, real development at all. And, and, you know, we've got one, my ex-press secretary, who had his time as Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has now set a benchmark for reform. There should be no losers, he says. I won't live that long. Um, I'll just turn to the uh, future of the labour market. Um, the proposition is that 30% of jobs will disappear. There's nothing we can do about it. <clears throat> Ever since the Industrial Revolution, people have thought jobs are going to disappear as a result of new technology. And they haven't. Um, one noted economist, the inventor of the supply side model, said he could see technological change everywhere except in the productivity numbers. In fact, productivity is falling and technological change is the major driver of productivity growth. But productivity growth has been falling. Um, my own view of that is that it's probably more to do with the lack of demand and the lack of investment and technology actually makes a difference through new investment. We've had, we've had very much less new investment, so that's an explanation of why technological progress hasn't been as fast. And then, frankly, the atrophying of skills and so on through the unemployment and so on. But um, you can never know you're right about the future when it comes to predicting technology and its impact. All I can say is that uh, in the past, we've always managed to create new jobs as old jobs finished. And I think one of the reasons why people are so pessimistic is you can always see where the jobs are going to disappear, but you can't see where the new jobs are going to come from. And the biggest reason for that is that the increased incomes get spent. Now, I'll give you an example. Technological progress made a huge difference to the cost of airline travel. All of us expect to go overseas in our lifetimes, some of us much more than once in our lifetimes. But, you know, my parents never went overseas, um, <coughs> except to the war. Um, uh, he didn't come back either. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact is that the cost of air travel fell and, we all, and, and the demand for tourism has massively increased. And while we need to change the skills, because the skill, technological progress has been skill biased, you need to bear in mind that a lot of jobs are being created that, don't, that are unlikely to be overtaken by robots or machines. I'm thinking of things like the caring industry, gardening, cleaning and so on, hospitality. There are a lot of jobs there that will not be done by machines. For what it's worth, um, the uh, four learned academies that were referred to earlier 
one of their projects was to look at the impact of technology on our society, economy, etc. And their considered opinion was that this is not, oh, there's clearly a challenge in adapting to it, but we shouldn't be so fearful that they're not going to be those jobs. Well, let's stop on that optimistic note, and if you wouldn't mind thanking our presenters for this evening.